All right, so uh, Invincible Numinist has made a couple videos responding to you, James, on determinism. And as you can see, I'm emulating his style, you know, Dragon Ball Z, Raging Blast 2. Yeah, although Newman actually got, he claimed to have been trying to emulate the actual battles, but he got a number of things wrong. For starters, Frieza actually fights Vegeta in his first form as well as in his fourth, uh, and that didn't happen. Also, he used a technique against Vegeta, which he didn't wasn't supposed to use until he started fighting Goku. And also, when he was uh, fighting Cell against Trunks and Vegeta, he forgot to include Krillin in there because Krillin just totally gets owned by Cell. Uh, so, as you can see, this is a protest against this injustice because I'm playing as Krillin here and I'm totally kicking the shit out of Metacooler. Which, you know, is a protest because A, Krillin never fought Metacooler in the first place, and B, if he did, then he would totally get the shit kicked out of him. But anyway. Invincible Numinist mentioned determinism, and one of the things he was talking about in the video was the problem of induction. Now, we shared a brief exchange on the subject in a blog TV a uh, number of months ago, and we didn't really continue it for all that long, so I think this is the perfect chance to elaborate on this particular subject. Basically, my argument is that the problem of induction might have been a problem back in Hume's time because he didn't have some of the logical tools that we have now. Tools like uh, statistics and probability theory, at least in their modern forms. So, basically, and I've been meaning to make a video on statistics for a while because it's very important, I think, to epistemology. But I'm just going to leave you with a little taste right now, and I'm going to show you the basics of the logical tools that we have now that Hume didn't. Now, if you take a look at equation one here, what you have is you're trying to estimate the mean of a certain quality in the population. That's represented by mu sub x. Now, we can estimate this by taking a sample of several members of the population and taking the mean of that. That's represented by x bar on the right side of the equation. However, because this isn't going to be a perfect estimate, we have to add a plus or minus factor to say that the mean is somewhere within this interval. And you can calculate what this confidence interval uh, has to be and what you get is equation one here. Now I'm going to define E as the plus or minus uh, factor because it's the error. It's the error that you have uh, in estimating the mean. Now the T that you see in equations one and two is a function of the confidence that you have in the interval represented by P. And essentially the confidence in an interval is how likely it is that that interval captured the true value. In this case, the mean of the population. And for, like, if you want 95% confidence, I think the value is 1.96. I don't know. It depends on your degrees of freedom. But anyway, this is an okay estimate. So I define E as being T times S, which is the standard deviation of your sample, divided by the square root of N, where N is the size of the sample you've taken. Now, equation 3 is just equation 2 rearranged and solved for T, which, as I told you before, is a measure of how confident you are in the interval. Notice that uh, t is proportional to the square root of the sample size. This means that as your sample size increases, your 
confidence in the interval also increases. In other words, when you increase the sample size, you also increase the likelihood that the answers you get of the sample are also going to be the close to the answers of the population. Now, this isn't 100% certain. I mean, no matter how many white swans you observe, there's always the chance you're going to find a black swan. But, and we actually have found black swans, so, you know, that's a perfect example. However, no person who uses induction claims that it's 100% certain. With induction, all knowledge is tentative. It's different from deduction, where everything is certain. And what you have is the more samples you take, the more likely you've determined what the population is. That's all induction is claiming, really, the, that the more... Uh, times you evaluate something, like the more times you see the sun rise, then the more likely it is that the next morning when you go out and look, you'll see the sun rise. And again, it's not 100% certain. In fact, in the North and South Poles, there are times when the sun doesn't rise at all. So of course it's not certain. But you still have a situation where the more samples you take, the more you can infer that the samples reflect what is actually happening. Now, maybe you're not claiming that uh, this is, you know, a, that induction doesn't provide you with knowledge or that the problem of induction says that, but you're just claiming, as I've established, that induction isn't 100% certain. Well, okay, in that case, we're in agreement, but if that's, the, that's not what the problem of induction says, at least not as I understand it. The problem of induction is seeking to establish whether or not we can gain knowledge from induction. This knowledge doesn't have to be 100% certain. And again, as I've established, the more samples you take, the more likely it is that uh, you can have knowledge about the population. So that's all I was going to say on the problem of induction. This is just basic, you know, statistics. And as for determinism, yeah, we both know that you, James, is a complete moron here. Uh, my own position is I'm not a determinist in the sense that you can absolutely predict, even in principle, you know, what a person's behavior is going to be because you know, you have quantum mechanics. Now, ignoring the fact that a person's brain is an essentially classical system and therefore an essentially deterministic one, there's always a chance that you're not going to be able to predict it because of some random quantum event happening. However, these quantum events are still statistically determined. They follow a given statistical distribution here which actually makes this a nice thing to link with the statistics I was talking about earlier. But quantum mechanical systems follow a statistical distribution. Now, I don't think that that gives any more credibility to the idea of free will, because free will implies that you're making the choices, whereas according to what we know about quantum mechanics, ignoring certain interpretations of it, uh, it follows a statistical distribution. So I don't think quantum mechanics does anything for free will. So I'm what I call a statistical determinist, and I'm not a compatibilist. Compatibilist. So that's all I have to say on these subjects. Uh, see ya.